It's interesting to me because it's not like the Judeo-Christian story was really a happy one, as, as far as I can tell. You know, I mean, there was heaven, but the chances you were going to get in, man, that was low. So then the question came to me, do I believe in God? And I don't like that question. And then the third is that I'm afraid that he might exist, which I think is the most comical of the three answers and perhaps the most accurate one. Hello. You just heard a few words from Dr. Jordan Peterson. If you don't know Dr. Peterson, you need to look him up and begin to listen to some of his videos. He has many out there. He is a man who is seeking the truth. Just this past weekend, my wife and I were led to listen to a new video that he uh, posted to YouTube entitled, Who Dares Say He Believes in God? It is so compelling. Dr. Peterson is a man who is seeking the truth. And because he's seeking the truth, he is trying to understand what the truth requires of him. He's a man who admits that he is even afraid to say that he believes in God because to say that to him has horrifying significance. It means that he has to live a way to live in a way that he doesn't think he can. That he has to be perfect just as his understanding of God is that God is a perfect God. And he clearly understands that God being a perfect God would expect his people to be perfect as well. Well, Jesus said that. Jesus told those who listened to him, you must be perfect even as my Father in heaven is perfect. Dr. Peterson takes those words seriously. And for him, it is a fearful thing to say that he believes in God. And it should be a fearful thing for you. And it should be a fearful thing for me. And rightly, Dr. Peterson points to the great hypocrisy within the church. And even in this video, he points out the hypocrisy in the Catholic Church and their pedophilia. That the, Trump, that the Pope says that he is dealing with. And he asks you would have thought that they would have dealt with that issue a hundred years ago or maybe a thousand years ago. After all, the Catholic Church has been with us now for almost 2,000 years. Why are they grappling with pedophilia? Why are they grappling with homosexual sin within the priesthood? Can those priests say that they believe in God? Those are the kinds of questions that Dr. Peterson asks. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. And he knows that. The question is, do we know that? Do we Christians know that? Do we understand that? How is it? How is it that so many Christians can live in defiling sin? That so many Christians can practice sin on a daily basis? I watched a little bit of a video today by a man named Praying Medic that I would encourage you to look at and listen to. 
He was raised a Catholic. He told his parents, I'm not going to church anymore when he was 13 years old. He saw the hypocrisy. He understood the hypocrisy. He became an atheist and he did not come to faith in Jesus Christ until he was 38 years old, 25 years later. The church is filled with hypocrisy. To understand that hypocrisy, I now want you to listen to another little bit of this video from Dr. Peterson. Listen to these words and try to apply them to yourself. Have you approached God like this? Have you thought of your relationship with God like the way Dr. Peterson describes? Think carefully about it. After you watch this little clip, we will discuss it some more. Well, then you look at what are, what are you called upon? Let's say if you're going to proclaim yourself as a believer, you know? And, and I thought about this a lot as I've gone through the Old Testament. I did a bunch of lectures last year. And so what are you called upon? Well, you're called upon initially to act out the spark of divinity that's within you by confronting potential with the logos that's within you, which means to take the opportunities that are in front of you, the potential future, and to transform it into the present in the best possible way using truth and courage and careful articulation as your, as your, as your, as your, as your guide. So that's the first thing you're called on to do. That, that's a major deal there. That's a tough one. And then the second is to make the proper sacrifices. That's the Cain and Abel story. It's like you, you want something, you genuinely want it, you want to set the world straight, then you let go of what's necessary and you pursue. You let go of what isn't necessary, no matter what it is, no matter what it is. And then you pursue what's necessary. And then maybe you sacrifice your children to God. That, that was the story. Um, that's the, one of the next stories that comes up, of course, and you think, well, that's pretty damn barbaric, and the way the story's laid out, of course it is, but um, that isn't exactly what it means. It means that what you try to do when you raise children is that you try to do everything you can to impress upon them by imitation and by instruction and by love and by encouragement that they are crucial beings in the world whose ethical decisions play an important role in shaping the structure of reality itself and that they have the moral responsibility to do that. And you get your ark in order, that's your family, let's say, so that when the storms come, you can stay above water for the 40 days of flooding and you're capable of leading your people through the desert when the desert makes itself manifest and you can escape from tyranny properly because you're wise enough to see it. And you take the full burden of being on yourself, all the suffering that's that's part and parcel of that. You accept that voluntarily, let's say, and you do everything you can to confront the malevolence that's part of you and that's part of the state and that's part of the world. And you, you, you make a garden around you. That's the paradise, a walled garden. It's a walled, well-watered place. So the forces of nature and society exist together in harmony. And you place your family in that so that they can live properly. And you treat your enemy as if he's yourself. And the same with your brother. And, well, then you can say, then maybe you can say, maybe then you have the right to say, that you believe in God. Just after Dr. Peterson makes these statements, he quotes from Luke chapter 18, <clears throat> but he misquotes it. Luke 18, verse 18 says this, and a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Dr. Peterson says that Jesus 
said to him, Don't call me good. The reason I believe that he said that is because Dr. Peterson knows that a man, a man like him, a man like you, a man like me, cannot be good. But really, Luke 18, 19 says this. Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Jesus did not dispute the fact that he was good. What was he saying? Well, the ruler says, you know the commandments. Or Jesus said this, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And the ruler said, all these I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. The rich ruler did not receive eternal life because he sold all of his things and gave them away. Jesus did say that he would receive treasure in heaven by doing that, but that's not how he would inherit eternal life. No, he would be free to follow Jesus if he got rid of everything that kept him tied down to where he was. The only way that he could have eternal life was to follow Jesus. You see, Jesus is God. And that's the stumbling stone. That's why Dr. Peterson can't really go there. He, he says he's a Christian. He will say that. But he says, almost, he says, I have to be because I live in a, in the, in a Western culture. The whole culture is based on Judeo-Christian principles. If you watch him, you see that he has a soul in torment. He's a man who seeks the truth. He wants the truth. This is why he will argue with people and why he will tell people what he believes because he wants other people to know the truth too. And he wants to get better at understanding the truth. I commend him. I love him. But Dr. Peterson can never be good enough. That's why he doesn't want to say that he believes in God. He knows that with that statement, with that belief comes responsibility. And he's not good enough. He tells you he's not good enough. I'm not good enough. You're not good enough. But I will say this. Yes. I believe in God. I dare say that I believe in God. Well, how can I do that? How can I? How can I dare say that I believe in God without fearing that he will strike me down because I dare to approach him? Isaiah asked the question, who can dwell with everlasting burnings? Who can? Isn't that hell? Isn't that hell? The one who would dare 
believe in God would also dare everlasting burning. But it's not hell. My God is a consuming fire. But why don't I fear that fire? The ruler said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus said, there is only one good. No one is good except God alone. But then he told this man to sell everything and follow me because I am God. I am God alone. I am good. And so So many Christians will take this belief in Jesus. They believe that Jesus died for their sins, but yet they don't change their lives. They continue to engage and indulge in sin. They practice sin. They don't repent of their sin. They go on sinning. And they think everything is hunky-dory with them and with God. They don't fear God like Jordan Peterson does. Jordan Peterson has a healthy fear, a healthy respect for God. Most Christians don't have, and he knows that. He quotes Nietzsche just before that last clip a philosopher who said there's only been one Christian, one true Christian, and he died on the cross. Well, I don't think that's true. I think that there have been faithful Christians, and I think that there are faithful Christians now. In the Word of God, the Bible says that these faithful Christians are overcomers. They do not accept the mark of the beast. They agree with Jesus that they ought to be perfect as their heavenly father is perfect. And that's what Jordan Peterson believes. And that's what scares him so badly. And it should scare us too. Except for one thing. Jesus the man was God in the flesh, our creator, who came to earth, God who came to earth in flesh and died for our sins so that we could have eternal life with him. He did that on his own. We didn't have to ask him to. There was nothing we needed to do. It was a unilateral covenant, something that he did for man. And he did it for every man, for all the world. Go to the end of the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, chapter 22. And you will see that outside of heaven, outside of New Jerusalem, there are still sinners. They can't get in. It's the outer darkness. But I guarantee you that at least one of those sins, you still do. I still do. I'm not saying that I still practice it or that you still practice it. But we can't do it perfectly. 
We cannot live a sinless life in this flesh. And that's why Jesus came. Because he fulfills the law. He fulfills the perfection for us. And that's how I get in. And that's how you get in. And that's how Dr. Peterson will get in. Jesus is the stumbling stone. People can't get over that. They can't understand how could this be. You can only understand it if you understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. That God created us and that he did this for us. None of us will get in without him. When the time comes, and if you are asked, why should I allow you in to heaven? Don't say you did this, 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 and this, that you were great, 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 and great. Say, because you paid the price for me. I understand that's the only way I get in. But don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly as the church has, as the multitude of Christians have. Don't take it lightly. Don't take sin lightly. Understand that Jesus does, in fact, want you to be perfect as his heavenly Father is perfect. And that is the mark of the overcomer. That is the mark of the one who will be allowed into heaven, who will be allowed into New Jerusalem, who will have a glorious entrance into the kingdom of God. And so if any of you know Dr. Peterson, if you could somehow speak a word to him or to any other like him, that fears to say that he believes in God because he knows that it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a righteous God. Then tell them, tell him that that God prepared a way. Jesus Christ is the way.